Good evening and welcome to Phoenix Fellowship's Midweek Bible Study. We would like to begin our study tonight with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we open our Bibles to the things that you have shown us in your word, I pray that your spirit will be present in this study, in my heart and in my mind, and in the hearts and minds of my listeners. I pray, Lord, that your word will come alive as we study it, and it will make sense to us that we're, that our hearts will be able to embrace the things that we discover. In Jesus' name, amen. So in our last study, we studied the subject of what the Bible has to say about heaven, and along with that, the new earth. And uh, we found that heaven is actually a place, not just a cloud in which the saved in some unembodied spirits sit and play a harp for eternity. It's actually a place where people are, where God is, where his throne is, where angels are, thousands and thousands, ten thousands, of them. It's a, it's a wonderful place, and it's a place that we, as God's children, have been promised that we would go when Jesus returns. Tonight, we're going to actually be studying a subject that is kind of the opposite of what heaven was all about. We're going to find out what the Bible has to say about hell. Tonight is actually part one of a two-part series because we cannot adequately cover in one study the things on this subject that are pertinent to us as God's children. There are things that we must take the time to adequately cover in order to understand properly the subject. Before I actually begin this study, I would like to say this to my listeners. You don't have to agree with the conclusions that I come to tonight. We are in a fellowship that allows for differences of opinions on different subjects that are not critical to our salvation. However, having said that, I want to say that I believe that what I have to tell you tonight is scriptural. And because God has given us this information in his word, I think it's important that at least you listen to what I have to say, and hopefully you will learn something out of our study tonight, hopefully. The study of the subject of hell is one that carries with it different opinions, different perspectives. You look at one verse and it'll tell you one thing and you think that that's the whole picture, but then you have to compare other verses with that verse and you have to put the picture together so that the whole puzzle of Scripture on this subject fits together as a puzzle. You can't take just one verse and base a doctrine on one verse. And so we tonight will be doing just that. And hopefully it will make sense to you. And hopefully you will learn something that you didn't know before. So tonight we're going to try to answer one particular question. Of course, we will be studying other facets of this subject along the way, but we would like to answer a question. Where is hell? We talked about where heaven is and what heaven is like. We talked about the new earth and what the new earth is going to be like. And tonight we would like to talk about where hell is. Where does the Bible say that hell exists? Our first text is going to come from Matthew 25, where Jesus is speaking. Jesus spoke of hell on a number of occasions, and you will remember some of them. He said, it is better for your hand to be cut off than for your whole body to be cast in hell, referring to the things that might cause us to separate ourselves from God through sin. It is better for an eye to be plucked out than for the whole body to to burn in hell. So Jesus talked about hell a number of times, and this is one occasion when he did so. In Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to read beginning with verse 31, it says there, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, 
Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd, shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on one side, his right hand, and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But then in verse 41 it says, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire. And this is the part I want you to get. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell is not for us. It shouldn't be for us. It need not be for humanity because hell was originally prepared for the devil and his angels who had have caused so much havoc in our world today and who have created such evil and such wickedness and such pain and heartache in our world. So, that's the first thing I want to say is that, that hell was never prepared for people. It was never intended for people. Jesus himself said it was prepared for the devil and his angels. So where is hell? There's only one place in the Bible that tells us where hell is. Just one place. And it's in the last chapters of the book of Revelation. Actually, chapter 20, the third from the last chapter of the Bible, is the only place in Scripture that says where hell is. So let's turn to Revelation, but we're going to turn to chapter 19, the chapter before, and we want to look at the, the backdrop for what God has to tell us in chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 19, beginning with verse 11, we have a wonderful and amazing and incredible description of the coming of Jesus Christ. I'd like to read that passage to you that tells of the coming of Jesus Christ, beginning with verse 11 of chapter 20. You might want to follow along in your Bible because there's some important things that we will be looking at in this chapter and the next one to follow. John says in verse 11, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. We're going to come back to that phrase in just a moment. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is a picture of the second coming of Jesus as John describes it in the book of Revelation. It's a picture of the advent of Christ. And it says that he comes in righteousness and he judges and makes war. We're going to talk about why he is actually doing that, why he is coming on a white horse as, as he is followed by the armies of heaven. And he comes with, and it says, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. This is a time of judgment. This is a time when Jesus Christ is coming into the realm of 
earth to bring judgment upon the wicked. Verse 17 says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And so this next passage, this next section of Revelation 19 follows Jesus Christ coming on the white horse with a robe dipped in blood and a sword coming from his mouth. And he is calling, this, the angel, this angel is calling for the great supper, a great, a great slaughter that is to take place. As we look at other passages of Scripture that tell us about the coming of Jesus, we don't see this same scenario painted for us. For instance, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says that he will come with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. And this is such a hopeful scene because those who have died in Christ are resurrected to join those who are living in Christ. And the living and the resurrected saints go up into the heavens to meet Christ in the air. This is a joyful reunion, a joyful experience, a rescue. But in this particular passage in Revelation, it shows that there is there is a slaughter about to take place, that Jesus Christ is coming with the armies of heaven, and there is going to be a slaughter of the wicked. There is going to be kings and, and people, small and great, who are subject to the judgment of God as he comes out of the clouds of heaven. The truth is, and we said this earlier, you have to look at both parts of scripture and you see a deliverance for the people of God. It's also judgment upon those who are pursuing the righteous to destroy them. And that's what we see happening. And I'd like to take you to Revelation chapter 16, where we see this other part of the picture that is painted for us. In Revelation chapter 16, and we look at verse 12 and onward, this is the sixth plague that is poured out upon the earth, upon the wicked, not the righteous, the wicked. Remember in the, the story of, of um, the deliverance of Israel in, out of Egypt, there were 10 plagues that were poured upon the Egyptians to force Pharaoh's hand to let God's people go from the slavery that they had been in for 400 years. So also there are seven plagues that are poured out upon the wicked just prior to and at the time of the coming of Jesus Christ. And so this text tells us about one of the plagues, the sixth plague, beginning in Revelation 16 and verse 12. It says, And the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And so it says, these spirits of demons are performing signs, and they go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the great battle of the great day of God Almighty. This battle is called, in, the, in verse 16, it says they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. So this, what's happening here when Jesus comes on this white horse with the sword coming out of his mouth and he's, this angel calls and says that there's going to be a great supper, a great slaughter for the birds of the air to come and feast on the dead. This is Jesus Christ coming at the beginning of the battle of Armageddon as, 
as the people that are under the influence of the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon are pursuing the righteous. It says so in Revelation 13. It says there will be a death decree, and they will decree that those who do not worship the beast or his image will be killed. And so the wicked, the unsaved, those who are under the influence of Satan and his surrogate, the beast, which we've studied in other studies, and the false prophet, which is one that we are going to identify in another Prophecy Watch study. These three powers in the earth and those who are following them are pursuing the righteous. And this is what the battle of Armageddon is. It is a spiritual war that is going on between good and evil, between the wicked and the righteous, those who are God's people, they are pursuing them. And so Jesus Christ is coming out of the clouds with judgment on his mind. But in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9, it says, When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, and holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. That's what he's doing. In Revelation 19, he's coming to avenge the blood of the saints that have been taken. And then in verse 12, notice this in verse 12, it says, And I looked when he had opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. These are the events that immediately precede and surround the coming of Jesus Christ. This fleshes out the picture a bit. And we have to see all of the pieces as they come together at the time of the coming of Jesus. And verse 13 says, And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Going back to Revelation chapter 19, it says, the angel was calling for the birds of the air to come and gather together for the great supper of God, that they may eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of captains, mighty men, the horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all free and slave, both great and small, those who are in, in rebellion against God and are pursuing his people. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. This is the battle of Armageddon that is taking place at this time. First, the enemy of God's people are pursuing them. And now we have Jesus Christ coming from the, from the heavens with his armies to deliver and to strike with his sword those are pursuing his people. Jesus intervening for his people. And now in verse 19 and 20 and 21, as this war is taking place, it says, they, the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gather together to make war against Jesus Christ, who is on the horse and against his army. It says, the beast was captured and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. This is the beginning of hell right here. This is the beginning. This is, this is the first time in the Bible that we have the term the lake of fire in is the fires of hell. And it says in verse 21, 
and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So this is the beginning of hell and the lake of fire. Just a picture to actually kind of give you a visual of what we're talking about. The lake of fire, this is hell. And where does it begin? It begins at the time of the battle of Armageddon when God's people are being pursued by the, the wicked, by the beast and the false prophet and the dragon. They are being pursued by Satan and his hosts and his agents on earth. And it says that Jesus comes and he kills the people with his sword, the wicked, and he casts the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire. This is the first time and the first place that we actually see this imagery being shown to us in regard to hell. So, now we'd like to go to chapter 20. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3 as we see what happens to Satan. It says that the beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire, and all of the wicked that are working with them are killed with the sword that comes from the mouth of Jesus Christ, the Savior, as he is interceding for his people. And it's at this time that God takes his children up into the air. This is where 1 Thessalonians 4 comes in, where Jesus Christ receives them up into the clouds, and they meet him in the air. Jesus said, and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you also may be. This is the time when Jesus receives his people into his presence, into the clouds, and where we all go back to, to be with Christ. But where, where is the beast and the false prophet? They are thrown into the lake of fire. What happens to the wicked at this time? The rest of the wicked, that they, they are killed with the sword that is that is in Christ's mouth. And what happens to Satan and his angels? That's what we read about beginning in verse 1 of chapter 20. Follow with me, if you will, in your Bibles. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. This bottomless pit, what is the bottomless pit? This is not hell. This is not fire. This is a place is in the Greek. In, in, in the Greek, it's called the abyss, the abyss. And we're going to look at four texts where this term, the same term is used, this bottomless pit is used uh, to describe the condition of the earth at this time. Think about it. There is there's been chaos in our world. The trumpets have destroyed much. The seven trumpets have destroyed much of the earth. The, the wicked and the wars and the, 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 the carnage that has been going on just prior to the coming of Jesus has destroyed much of the earth. You think the riots of recent times was destructive. This is the whole earth that is in this condition. And, and now all of the wicked, all of the people that Satan has tempted over the years, and especially in these last portions of history, they're dead. They're laying on the ground. The birds are eating their flesh. They're dead. And, and so Satan is in a... Satan is left in the earth. The saints return to heaven. And we'll see that in the verses, particularly next time as we study portions of this chapter that we won't have time to study tonight, but the, the saints are taken to heaven. They have 
gone to where Jesus lives to inhabit the mansions, the homes that God has prepared for them that Jesus said he would prepare for us. And the wicked are dead on the earth and Satan is all by himself. He and his angels are all by themselves in what is called the bottomless pit. I want to take you to Jeremiah. There are three texts in the Old Testament that use the same language as we see in this passage. Same language, and they are prophecies of this particular point in time. The first one is in Jeremiah chapter 4. The Old Testament is less descriptive. It's more shrouded in language that was a little harder to understand. But many of the prophecies of the New Testament are given in the Old Testament, and this is one of them. Jeremiah chapter 4. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to Jeremiah chapter 4. And I'd like to read verses 23 through 26. And we will see what the condition of the earth is in at this point in time. Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning with verse 23. Notice how this is descriptive of what we just read. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, without form and void. The heavens had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. This is what we just read about in Revelation 6, when Jesus comes the earth, islands disappear. Mountains are moved out of their place. I beheld indeed there was no man. And all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness. And all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. Isn't that what we just read about in Revelation? Go with me now to Isaiah. Chapter 34 and verse 1 says, Come near, you nations, to hear, and heed, you people. Let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all things that come forth from it. For the indignation of the Lord is against all nations, and his fury against all their armies. Remember, we, it says that they had gathered their armies there in Revelation uh, uh, chapter 19, it says that the armies had gathered together against God as he was coming, as Jesus, as he was coming through the clouds and into this earth. And it says, for the indignation of the Lord is against all nation and his fury against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to slaughter. Also their slain shall be thrown out. Their stench shall rise from their corpses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved. The heavens, the stars, the heavens. There's no light. Remember in the other text it said there's no light. And the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. Didn't we just read that in Revelation chapter 6? As Jesus comes, the heavens roll back as a scroll as he enters in to earth's uh, environment. All their hosts shall fall down. The stars fall from heaven as the leaf falls from the vine and as fruit falling from a fig tree. And then in verse 6, it says, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. And then later in verse 6, for the Lord has a sacrifice and a great slaughter. Verse 8, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion, his people. So this is where, and, in, and actually in verse 11, the very last word in verse 11 is the same word, the same Hebrew word. Bohu is the word in the Hebrew that describes emptiness. The earth is empty. It's desolate. It is without form and void. Can you think of another verse in the Bible where this term is used, the earth is without form and void? Yes, it is the same Hebrew word, bohu, again, that is used in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The same Hebrew word is used in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Genesis to describe the condition of the earth. It is the bottomless pit. And then in the New Testament, we have reference to this abyss, this, uh, this bottomless pit, this bottomless pit. And the Greek word here is abusos, meaning abyss. And the story is that Jesus has just healed a demon-possessed man. And Jesus confronts the demons and says to them, what is your name? And they responded, legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss, the bottomless pit. It's the same Greek counterpart to the Hebrew that we just read in Genesis and in Jeremiah and Isaiah. And this is the place of the demon's habitation. And it is a place of desolateness. It is a place where now Satan is chained in a bottomless pit. Not chained literally. How do you chain an angel, right? How do you put, put chains around the wrists and the feet of an angel? It is the angels are spirits, but he is bound by circumstances. He is by himself for the first time, for the first time in earthly history, he is alone by himself and no one to cause to fall. So I'd like to go now to verses seven through 10. We're going to skip four through six for next time because it's like a it's, it's a different scene there. And in verse 7, we're going to pick up. It says in verse 3 that he has no more nations to deceive until the thousand years are finished. And in verse 7, it says, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Why? Because there are going to be people around again. This is the second resurrection. When, when the dead... The first resurrection is when the righteous dead are raised and are taken up to be with Christ. But the wicked dead are not raised at that time. Now we have the wicked dead resurrected. And this is the second resurrection. And uh, it says and it says that when the thousand years has expired, Satan was released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth to gather them to gather to battle, to gather them to battle. What happened initially? They are gathering together. It says in verse, um, in chapter 19, it says in verse 19, in chapter 19 and verse 19, it says, And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and his army against his army. So, this this whole scene of the beginning of the beginnings of Armageddon and the beginnings of hell and those things which are surrounding this time, they start with the the enemies of God gathering together for battle. And now at the end of the thousand years, the battle continues. They gather together, it says. Satan releases and he goes out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Now it isn't just the wicked who are alive at the coming of Christ, but the, the wicked dead are resurrected as well. And so we have all of those of all history who have followed after Satan and his, and his devices and his deceptions, who are gathered together to make battle, to make war against Christ. And his armies, and it says they are as the sand of the sea. And verse 9 says they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, which has now come back down from God with God out of heaven. It's the, it's the picture 
that John paints in Revelation chapter 21, where the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, comes down from God out of heaven after the thousand years are finished. It comes down, and God is now going to make his home with us. But as it is coming down, as the city comes down with all of the saints, it says they went up, the wicked went up on the breadth of the earth. Where are they going? The breadth of the earth as the city comes down to the earth. As the saints come down to the earth with God. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And what happened? Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. This is hell. This is the only place in scripture that tells us where hell is. And it says... The devil, verse 10, who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet had been cast and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So where is hell? Hell is here on the earth. Hell is the earth on fire. Hell is the place of the wicked and where the wicked remain after the saints are taken to heaven with Christ when he comes at the beginning of the thousand year, this millennial period of time. Satan is bound in the prison of desolate earth with nothing around him. It is the earth as it was prior to creation. And now it is earth in its same chaos as it was. It is without form and void, it says. And the saints have gone to heaven and now they come back at the end of the thousand years with Christ and the war resumes, the battle of Armageddon resumes. And as the wicked that are as the sand of the sea gather around to take the city that has come down out of God, out of heaven, the war continues against Satan and his hosts and Jesus Christ, the one who was victor and the and it says that fire comes down out of heaven and devours them. And Satan and his angels are cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet had been cast. So, let me do my best to kind of summarize what we have studied. Hell does not exist today. Hell is when the earth is on fire as evil is being destroyed at the end of the millennium that is spoken of in Revelation 20. When hell has done its work of cleansing, a new earth will be created by God. That's what chapter 21 is about, which we read about and read from in our last study, the new Jerusalem comes down of, out of heaven with God and with the saints and comes to this earth. And it is a huge city. Remember, 1,500 miles wide and long and high. And in the city is a home that God has prepared for his people. And we come back to this earth where God will recreate this earth. He will recreate this earth over the old earth with all of the ash where the fire has destroyed the wicked. He recreates it and the saved will live here through eternity and we will have homes. We will build homes. We will plant gardens, it says, plant vineyards. We will have families. There will be children. But what about hell? What happens to hell? Because if earth is hell, if the place of hell is the earth, as fire comes down from God out of heaven and destroys those who are attempting to take the city, they are still in rebellion against God. And fire comes down out of heaven and destroys them. Where's the earth going to be? The new earth. It's going to be created right on top of the old. I'm going to turn to Malachi chapter 4 read a verse that I think you will find very interesting. The last book of the Bible 
some of the last verses of the Old Testament. In Malachi chapter 4, it says this. See if this doesn't tell us about this day of the Lord's coming that we have talked about. Malachi 4, beginning with verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be, what? Stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch, nothing left. But you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. There will be no more tears, no more death, no sorrow. He will wipe away our tears from our eyes. The son of righteousness will arrive arise with healing in his wings and you shall go out and grow like a stall-fed calf and you shall trample the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this says the Lord of hosts so I'm going to take you just briefly through this last span of history on earth. Without looking up any texts from the Bible, we're just going to try to summarize in a narrative what takes place. We are living at a time right now when the events of earth tell us that we are living near the end of time. The, the pestilence the peace being taken from the earth, all prophesied in Revelation 6, tell us that we are living at the beginning of the end of time. As we move forward, and we've said this before, things are not going to get better, but worse, because evil is going to blossom in its fullness before Jesus comes. And Satan is going to be released to do some pretty horrible things in the earth before Jesus comes, one of which is that he will persecute those who are loyal to Christ, those who have an allegiance to him, those who belong to him, those who are safe in his, his protective care because of their faith in him. They are safe with him, but Satan will be pursuing them. He will be making war against the saints and the battle will get so intense, it says there will be a time of trouble such as never has been since the world began. And during that time of trouble, there will be chaos on the earth. The trumpets will blow. And look at those trumpets. And in Revelation chapter 8, it talks about what's going to be happening in the earth. Hail and fire mingled with blood will come and destroy a third of the trees and all the green grass. Then there is a great mountain burning with fire that is thrown into the ocean. We're going to have possibly an, possibly an asteroid or asteroids hitting the earth. And it sounds, it, sounds, it sounds almost sensational, but it's what the Bible says is going to happen. Revelation chapter 8. Go back to our Prophecy Watch study where we talk about the first four trumpets of Revelation 8. The earth is going to be in chaos. And then Satan is going to be pursuing the righteous and his agents, the beast, the false prophet, those agencies of Satan that are going to be working alongside of with him to destroy God's people. They want to destroy God's people. They can't get to Christ. Satan is still, still at war with God. And the only way he can reach God's heart is through the destruction of his people. So he is pursuing them. And it says that we will have to flee from the persecution that takes place. Revelation 6 talks about the blood that is shed by many and it would probably be those particularly who are carrying this final message to the world. The, 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 under the power of the Holy Spirit, it says the gospel will go to the whole world at the same time that the judgments of God are coming upon the, the, the earth and the people, the wicked of the earth, 
the same time, the voice of God will be heard through his messengers, the 144,000. They will be proclaiming the last message. Babylon is fallen. Babylon, Babylon is the beast. Babylon is that power of Revelation 13 that, that along with the false prophet decrees the death of those who are faithful to Christ. And in the midst of this battle, this is the battle of Armageddon. This is the battle of Armageddon. As Satan pursues God's people, out of the heavens comes a rider on a white horse with the armies of heaven following him. And a sword is coming out of his mouth and he slaughters the wicked. And he throws the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire. And Satan is bound on earth by the circumstances of the fact that there is no one here except him and his angels. He's bound on earth in this desolate place, this bottomless pit. It will be a bottomless pit, just as it was a place that is without form and void prior to the creation of the world. He will be bound for a thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years, and the saints will be in heaven with Christ. We will be there with him during that thousand year period. And then we will all come back with Christ in the, the new Jerusalem, that beautiful city will be descending and as the city descends, the wicked are resurrected. All from all ages are brought back to life. And Satan is once again released from his prison because now he has people with him. He has people to, to, to deceive and to think that they can go and take this holy city that is coming down from God out of heaven. And he will gather his armies together to war against the armies. And the battle of Armageddon continues until fire comes down out of God from heaven and destroys the wicked and Satan is cast into the lake of fire with the beast and the false prophet, it says. And that's hell right here on earth. And once evil and wickedness and all the vestiges of evil and wickedness are destroyed by fire, God will recreate a brand new earth here. The earth, which has been hell in many respects, even prior to hell, the hell fire, it will be created all brand new. And it says in Malachi, the righteous will walk upon the ashes of the wicked because underneath this great created earth, which has been purified by fire, God will create a new heavens and a new earth where he will actually make his tabernacle with us. He will bring the headquarters of his universe to us and live with us forever and ever. And we will have the Garden of Eden restored. It will be it will what happened with sin. When sin interrupted God's plan for mankind, that plan will resume. And we will have homes and we will build homes. We will have families the lions and the tigers will be played with. They will lay down with the lamb, it says. And we read that about that from Isaiah last week in our study. And there will be an eternity of home in this earth as we, as we raise families and as we build homes and as God is present with us and the angels and all of the redeemed from all ages, it says, that they will be without number. There will be a mighty host from all ages who have, who have responded to the call of Christ to follow him, to be his, as they have responded in faith to the gospel that saves us, the gospel of grace through faith alone in Christ. And that is how we will spend eternity. Beautiful picture, isn't it? No more evil, no more pain, no more death, no more devil. Only goodness and righteousness dwell in this earth. Next week, try to answer the questions. What about hell is everlasting, eternal? Because the Bible says that it is everlasting fire. And what is hell about forever and ever 
and the, the fire of their torment will be forever and ever. Does hell have an end? And we have to ask the question in this whole picture, what does hell have to say about God? We're going to try to answer those questions next week. Join us as we gather together and study again part two of what the Bible has to say about hell. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for bringing an end to evil in our world. Thank you for purifying this earth, for removing all vestiges of sin and evil and being willing to give us a brand new start in this brand new earth that you will create. With us there, we will probably watch you create the brand new earth. And we will be there with you. And we will live with you and with the saints throughout eternity. And the families that we will have will populate the earth and perhaps beyond. What a glorious future you have planned for us. I pray as we reach out to you this evening in faith that you will save us for that time of eternity with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.